Welcome to Plugged In. I'm Sean McDonald. And I'm Jennifer Mondelli. The night sky is full of wonder and questions. How many stars are in the sky? How far away are they? And is there life out there? Few of us ask ourselves about the process of star formation, but one researcher at the University of Toledo is developing theories that have the astronomy world re-examining some long-held beliefs about stars and galaxy formation. Plugged In's Ashley Trainum investigates. Since the dawn of time, humanity has looked to the stars in the heavens. Even with modern technology like the Hubble Space Telescope, often we find more questions there than answers. Such is the case for astronomer Dr. Rupali Chandar. Her observations now challenge our current understanding of star cluster formation in galaxies. The sun is about 4.6 billion years old, give or take a little bit. And when it formed, there's evidence that suggests that the sun formed as part of a group or a cluster of stars, but that over time, had 4.6 billion years, um, those stars have just sort of been gravitationally unbound. They've sort of wandered away into the galaxy. Now let's look at a very different example. Um, we also have these really remarkable objects in our galaxy called globular star clusters. And globular clusters are remarkable because A, they're about 12 billion years old. They're the oldest objects that we know of in the universe. And because they're so massive, they have incredibly high stellar densities. That means that there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stars within a few light years across. The conventional wisdom had been that clusters that were low mass should fall apart, should dissolve very quickly, um, whereas high mass clusters should stay together. For Dr. Chandar, that conventional wisdom came into question as she began to study data from the Antennae Galaxy. So this is a picture, a color picture of the Antennae Galaxies that was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see all of these massive young star clusters. Uh, so we wrote programs that would detect all of these clusters, that would make measurements, measure their light um, in all of these different wavelengths. And then we have our method for estimating the ages of the clusters. Here's a fuzzy little red blob. It's red because it's made up of older stars, probably. And the blue, that's the youngest And cluster. the blue are very young clusters. What we found was that the age distribution, the number of clusters, declined, decreased dramatically. So at a billion years, we were talking about 600 times fewer clusters than we would expect to see. That's a huge difference. The second part of that was then after we had looked at this steep decline in the number of clusters at older ages, we said, well, okay, let's look at lower mass clusters um, and see what they do. So we had really high mass clusters that, remember, we thought were impervious to disruption, and yet they looked like they were falling off in number very dramatically. We thought, okay, well, let's look at low mass clusters. Maybe they'll fall off in number even more dramatically, but nope those low mass clusters actually did exactly the same thing as the high mass clusters. The results basically imply that so many of these clusters, the vast majority of them that form, are going to fall apart um, and not survive for billions of years. To find an answer to why both large and small mass clusters are dissipating at an unexpected rate, Dr. Chandar has begun a new research project funded by the National Science Foundation. My current research project is the life cycle of star clusters, new windows into star formation and galaxy evolution. Um, we want to now check um, and, and determine the age distribution of these clusters in about 20 galaxies. We want to cover all different kinds of galaxies. We want to now include spiral galaxies. We want to include dwarf starburst galaxies, these kind of low mass galaxies that are forming stars at an incredibly high rate and see if that age distribution um, of the clusters looks like it's basically universal or not. Once we know that and we learn a bit more about these, the galaxies that host these clusters, um, we should be able to start um, getting a better understanding of the physical process that's driving um, this age distribution. So some of these are really special in that they do remain or, and will remain gravitationally bound for billions of years. We asked Dr. Chandar to show us an example of her current work. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's actually not too different from what we imagine our own galaxy would look like. You can see these extensions, these stellar extensions. These are what we were calling feathers. And on these feathers are all of these very massive 
fairly young. These are about 100 or 200 million year old star clusters. Because this galaxy has such regular structure, right, that's coming from these spiral arms, we can now look at the ages of the clusters in relation to different structure, right? right. So they have, we have these feathers here, um, and we have the spiral arms, and what we're trying to do is look at the ages of the clusters, for example, across the spiral arm, along the spiral arm, um, and that will give us some constraints on how they form and what's actually responsible for generating um, the spiral wave. And tell me a little bit, what does this all mean for you personally? I didn't expect to wake up one day and start, you know, to find something that was um, so controversial or so against the common wisdom. It's been incredibly exciting. Um, it really makes me want to get up and get to work and, um, you know, get to my computer and see what data is there and work with it and see what kinds of results are coming out um, and, you know, to see if we can understand more and more what all of this means. For Plugged In, I'm Ashley Trainum. The Hubble Space Telescope has changed the way astronomers see our universe. Now, thanks to a website called the Hubble Legacy Archive, anyone can access Hubble's amazing images. Ashley had a chance to follow up with Dr. Chandar and get a first-hand look at this incredible resource. So one really cool thing about the Hubble Space Telescope is that all the data that's ever been taken with this telescope is archived. Oh. And it's a public archive that anyone with a computer um, can access. So here's a real simple way of doing that. And so middle school kids, high school kids, college kids, astronomers um, can all do this. So you can put in whatever you want, um, some kind of astronomical object. I'm going to put in one of my favorites, the antennae galaxies. So I just put in antennae and I hit search. All right. And so now we can actually see the data. Um, and so here is a table of all the observations that Hubble has ever taken of this galaxy. There's lots and lots. You can see there's 16 pages with 20 uh, images on each page. And so now we can actually see the data. You can explore the cosmos by logging on to hla.stsci.edu. Who knows, you too may make a discovery from your laptop at home that will forever change the way we understand the universe we live in.